Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this daily devotional time in the book of Philippians. I'm glad that you've uh, joined me this morning. Our text this morning is Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read all the way to verse 11, verse 1 to verse 11, uh, but we'll probably only focus on the first four verses. But I think it will be important for us to read right up to verse 11, because in verse 11 we have really, a, or verses 5 through 11, we have an incredible example of what Paul is talking about in the first four verses of Philippians chapter 2. So just uh, again following the format we're using every morning, uh, we're going to pray, uh, then we're going to uh, read the passage, uh, then I will make some comments on the passage, uh, draw out some truths that I think are there for us to uh, uh, nourish our souls on today, and then we will pray again, and that will be a prayer of application. So we're uh, looking at Philippians 2. Let's pray first. Father, thank you so much for this new day that you have given to us. We are grateful to you for every mercy that you give to us in the Lord Jesus. Uh, we thank you that with the dawning of every day there are mercies and, and uh, blessings that come to us. Uh, this is the day that you have made, and we do want to rejoice and be glad in it but we also need this day our daily bread. We thank you for all the physical sustenance that we have that you have provided for us, but we need food for our souls also. And so we lift up our souls to you, O oh Lord, today. We lift up to you our hearts and our minds, and we pray you would feed us, you would stimulate our thoughts, you would prepare us for the challenges and the opportunities and even the difficulties that we will have this day. We need your grace. So give us food, we pray, from your holy word. Amen. So Philippians chapter 2, and as I said, we'll, we'll read from verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the, Fa the Father. Okay, um, here in these verses, particularly verses 1 through 4, um, Paul is continuing um, with this theme in his mind, which goes all the way back to chapter 1, verse 27. You remember that verse? Chapter, tw chapter 1, verse 27. We are to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. We're to live a certain way, living in a way that adorns, that reflects, that portrays, that makes the gospel attractive to, uh, to others. So that's, the, that's his main thought here, and this is still his continuing theme right into chapter 2. In other words, in chapter 2, he's beginning now to address certain areas or speak to us as to how we can live lives that are worthy of the gospel. Verses 1 through 4 uh, actually form one long sen sen sentence in the original lang language, and here Paul is making an appeal. Verses 1 through 4 are essentially an appeal to the Philippian bel believers, but certainly to us today. And what is this appeal about? It's an appeal for two things. It's an appeal for unity, and it's an appeal for mutual care within the church. 
So he begins um, by giving us the motivations, uh, motivations to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think verses 1 through 4, particularly the first two verses, you can sense the emotion in Paul. This is an emotional appeal that he is making to us. Notice these words. They're repeated several times in verse 1 and 2. If any, verse 1. If you have any, also verse 1. If any, comfort from his love. If any, fellowship with the Spirit. If any, tenderness and compassion. If any, if any, if any. What is Paul doing here? He's going back and he's appealing to them on the basis of their own experience. He's going back and he's appealing to them on what they have experienced in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about their salvation. He's talking about the way that they have uh, sensed the Lord in their lives from the beginning when they first trusted Christ until, until now. So he begins in verse 1, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Do you remember when that happened? Do you, do you remember when you were united with Jesus? Do you remember how encouraging that was to your, to your soul? That you now had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That you were linked with him, united with him. That his very life was your life too. Then the next phrase. If any comfort from his love. You experience Christ's love. You continue to experience Christ's love. You know that nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So, the idea here, here is you were loved unconditionally by Christ. And what a comfort that is to each of us, that, that this love is not dependent on us. It wholly comes from Him. The next phrase, if any fellowship with the Spirit, now this takes us right back to chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul talks about partnership or fellowship in the, the, the gospel. Now it's fellowship in the Spirit. So clearly, the fellowship that we enjoy in the gospel of Christ is a fellowship that the Holy Spirit creates. If you have had any fellowship with the Spirit. And uh, this, for me, this reminds me of 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, where Paul says, that our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we have fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul says to us that all of us have been baptized by the Spirit into one body. We have all been made to drink from the same Spirit. So we have been baptized by the Spirit, and we continually drink from the Holy Spirit. He gives us the very life of God himself. It also reminds me of 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, where at the, the benediction at the end of that letter, Paul says, May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. This is what we experience. The Holy Spirit came into us, and now we have this fellowship with God by means of the Holy Spirit. And then he adds the next phrase, if there's any tenderness and compassion. Again, a reminder to us of the mercy and the compassion that comes to us when we are saved and when we experience God's grace daily in our lives. So Paul takes them back to these past and, probably, and, and also present experiences. Past experiences with the Lord. Present experiences with the Lord. His love, His encouragement, His mercy. And He takes us back to these things as a part of His emotional appeal to us. And the appeal is that we are to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. We must focus on these things. This has to be the starting point, what we have already experienced in the Lord. And the reason why He's doing this in this passage is there is disunity within the Philippian church. Paul is very, very concerned about all of that. That goes all the way back to chapter 1 again, verse, verse 27. He, he wants them to stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith 
of the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And when he says in verse uh, two, "Make my joy complete in being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit," he's really addressing an issue here. He's addressing an issue in this church that there was disagreements, that the the, dis, the, the unity of the church was being threatened by their actions and by their attitudes towards each other. And so this emotional appeal, uh, remember what you have, what you all share together, this encouragement, this, this comfort, this tenderness and compassion that every one of you have received from the Lord. So his starting point really is the, the gospel. If there's disunity, what do you need to do? Well, go back and focus on fundamental gospel truths. And so now, as he talks about living worthily of the or living worthy of the gospel, his focus in verse two is on unity. So let's talk about talk about that. An appeal for unity. Let's keep in mind that unity is not the same as uniformity. Uh, uniformity is that which comes about because rules are made. We all put the same uniform on. We all walk in single file because someone is shouting out the rules to us. That's not what Paul is speaking about here. And this is the reason why he appeals to these spiritual motives in verse, in verse 1. What Paul is saying is that the disagreements that exist among, among you, the disunity that you have, it reveals that there is a spiritual issue in the fellowship of your church. And it isn't going to be solved by rules. It is only going to be solved when there is unity. Now, what is this unity based on? How do we get it? Well, I think when he says in verse 2, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, I believe, again, he's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're all different from each other. It's hard for us all to think the same way. It's hard for us all to conform in the same way. But there's one thing that does unite us, and it is the common purpose that we have. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this like-mindedness uh, flourishes when our minds are focused on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, five times in this passage all already, He's mentioned the gospel, the gospel, and I think this is Paul's plea, make my joy complete by, by being a gospel-oriented people. Uh, because as we relate to each other and care for each other, we must always keep the gospel of our Lord in mind. So the unity that he's talking about here is a gospel-oriented un un unity. He wants us to be gospel-oriented men and women. So he's not talking here about some vacuous uh, togetherness, but a oneness that is filled with dynamic pur purpose. And that purpose is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's important for us just to focus on this for a moment. I, I have been a Christian and a pastor long, long enough to know that churches can become very fixated about unity. We see this everywhere. We just sort of a, oh, we need to be united. And, and, and so unity becomes the goal. And when unity becomes the goal, we begin to compromise truth. We can compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ because we all want to be together if that is the real goal. But if the goal is the gospel, then unity happens. Because we can all agree on what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Fixation on the gospel is the very thing that creates unity. Some people say, well, the purpose of the church is worship. Well, there's an element of truth to that. But listen, if the gospel is not at the center of our very lives, then the worship that we offer will not be worship that is acceptable to God. The gospel is 
also at the very center of our worship. So it's not worship, it's not fellowship, it's not all of these other things that we should be focused on. What we focus on is the gospel, and that's what flourish, that's what creates and flourishes unity within our midst. The gospel has to be the center of our thinking, and it has to be at every level of of menace of menace ministry. So Paul says, "Make my joy complete." Uh, people that are united in this purpose of the gospel of Christ don't squabble about minutia. And Paul wants his joy to become complete by us becoming a gospel-oriented people. Because when we become gospel-oriented people, then we actually become others-oriented people. And I think others is really the key idea in this, in this passage. Verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look, verse 4, not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. That's the key idea within this passage. And so now we move from unity to mutual care. Mutual care. If we are a gospel-oriented pe people, then we will, in humility, consider others better than ourselves. Why? Because if there's anything that the gospel does, it shows us who we are. It reveals who we really are. The gospel helps us to do a self-assessment of ourselves. I'm thinking here of John Owen, um, who wrote the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. That's how he saw himself. And he saw himself as a wretch because he had done an assessment of his life through God's holy word. The gospel reveals our sinfulness. The gospel reveals our sinful state. And so we can then sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You see, when we see ourselves the way God sees us in our sin, the way the Bible tells us we really are, then that creates that humility that we all need. It creates a submissive mind. The gospel strips us of our pride and shows us who we really are. I think it was Andrew Murray who said, the humble person is not one who thinks meanly of himself. He simply doesn't think of himself at all. It is a grace that when you think you have it, you have lost it. And so the focus now, because of humility that comes through realizing that God has saved us as sinful as we really are, that humility then results in an others-oriented focus in our, in our lives. Verse 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Uh, isn't this at the heart of being a godly parent? Uh, you, you really can't be a good parent if you're totally into yourself. Frankly, you really can't be a good friend if you're totally into yourself. Friendship involves the flowing of interest toward another person. Good parenting involves the flowing of interest from yourself to your kids. Friendship flourishes in a flow of others' directedness. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, many years ago, this story was told of a pastor who uh, spoke to the conduct conductor of a symphony or orchestra. And the pastor asked this man, what is the most difficult instrument to play when a symphony or orchestra gathers? And the the conduct conductor said, the most difficult instrument to play is the second violin. He said, I, can't f I, I can find plenty of first violinists, but it is a problem to find someone willing to play second violin with enthusiasm. And if we have no second violin, we have no harmony at all. I remember hearing this little, uh, this little poem 
It takes more grace than I can tell to play the second fiddle well. That's what Paul is talking about here. Putting our own interests aside in humility and being concerned about the interests of other people. That's all a part of living lives that are worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this main admonition in chapter 1, verse 27, uh, that we are to live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus, demands that we have a united focus on the gospel so that we will be like-minded, we will have the same love, the same we will be one in spirit and have the same purpose. And this gospel-oriented unity will always show itself in care for each other. And so the source of this call, of course, uh, this call to live a manner worthy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's why Paul says in verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And Tomorrow we'll look at Jesus, the supreme example of what Paul is talking about here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for this practical instruction from the Apostle Paul. We confess, Lord, our unworthiness of your love and grace. We confess to you that we are sinners in need of grace. We confess to you, Lord, that sin is so much a part of us, that selfishness is so much a part of who we are, that it is difficult for us to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. But we pray today that you will help us to be so enthused and focused on the gospel that all of its principles begin to be lived out in our daily lives. We ask today, Lord, that you would help us to consider each other and to think about the interests of others more than we think about our own. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that we would be servants and we would be humble and we would live to help others. We ask, Lord Jesus, that the, the truths of the gospel of Christ would be such a motivation to us, the encouragement, the comfort, the the joy that we have in Jesus, the fellowship of the Spirit that we know in our, in our hearts, that this would be um, the motivation for us, Lord, to reach out to others and to serve others and to help them in practical ways. Lord, this is difficult for us to do as we are isolated in our homes. And so we ask for every grace in Jesus that you would, you would explode within our minds ideas as to how we can reach out to others and express concern to them, being motivated by the gospel of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you for this time together today. We commit our day to you, and we pray that you will help us to live it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. Just a reminder that we will not be having... Um, daily devotions on Friday because of our Good Friday service, which is 10 o'clock on, online. But we'll be here for the next two days, Wednesday morning and Thursday morning at 8. God bless you all.